Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to Wednesday. Today, I'm not sure what date it is. Oh, it's the 14th, I think, of March. And, uh, oh, today's Pi Day, 3.14.16, dot yada, yada, yada. And today's also is kind of, no, it's not funny, but, you know, Stephen Hawking's passed away today, the very famous uh, scientist, and uh, who, you know, think about math. So it's, it's kind of fitting for him to pass away on a day like today, 76. And we posted some stuff on CTSS, some incredible uh, uh, notes about things he's done, he did in his career, which is somewhat amazing. Uh, what we do, and then how do I connect this to this talk? Well, deep learning at Hopkins, my, the team I'm with doing pancreas, our main computer person is Alan Uly. Alan Uly's PhD, his mentor was Stephen Hawking. So everything sort of has a connection and uh, Today's Wednesday, and Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we have our Felix meeting. So that takes us to deep learning. So one of the things you notice on CT is Us, both on the website, but also on the Facebook page, I have been posting a lot of information about deep learning. You'll notice that one of our lectures, I think the current lecture on CT is Us, is Radiology 2025. And in that talk, I speak a lot about how deep learning is going to change radiology not just from the perspective of reading films and the expert reading of films, but also from scheduling, from managing patients, from managing our workflow, to managing our scanners. So deep learning is something that's going to impact every single part of radiology. What we're going to do on CTSS now, both in the Facebook page and our regular page, is start focusing a bit more on deep learning, trying to get you guys an understanding about where things are and where things are going. If you look at the press, both the scientific press and the lay press, there's not a day that passes where there's not information about deep learning, discovery, change, opportunity, innovation. And we want to make sure all of us are on top of that innovation. I know personally, I spend a lot of time reading a lot of things that I really don't understand in deep learning, but it's a challenge of being able to uh, move to the next level that I think we're all looking at. You'll see on CTSS starting, I think, in the next couple of days, under the, uh, we're going to have a section on deep learning. It's going to have review of different articles. It's going to have critical links. It's going to have pearls. You know, in our pearl section, we had deep learning built into different areas, uh, but now deep learning will have its own section. So we will be having a number of different opportunities for you to get more information about deep learning. And we'll try to keep it at a level that all of us are at. We're not going to be a, a computer scientists or physicists, but we want to move closely to learning more. Now, the word deep learning, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, the terms mean different things. But I think at the end of the day, what we're speaking about is how can we use computers to help us do tasks that we do on a daily basis? Now. Again, if I talk about the spectrum of deep learning in radiology, let's think about the easiest thing we do. What's the first thing we do? A doctor wants a patient to have a study. They want us to do a CT scan. Well, now you pick up the phone and you dial a number. You put on hold forever, speaking to someone who knows very little, who tries to be helpful but probably isn't. You frustrate the doctor, the nurse, the PA, the resident, whoever speaks to them, and they're unhappy negative experience to start the whole process. Well, all of you go to restaurants, whether it's Panero's or it's uh, the Charleston, that's the two ranges I eat at. I eat the cafeteria also, that's a range that's beneath the scale at Hopkins. But I think what happens is you, when you wanna go someplace, you go to open table, you say, I wanna go next Tuesday, I wanna go seven o'clock, and I want the four of us to be there. Put four people, you look at the restaurant, you pick it, or you say, I want Chinese food, and you look at the Chinese restaurants, you pick 7 o'clock, and maybe it's not available, you pick 7.15, or maybe it's a Chinese New Year, and everybody's eating Chinese food, and you have to wait another week, so you pick a different day. You do it very seamlessly. You get an acknowledgement that you have an appointment, a reservation. You get a reminder the day before or hours before telling you you have a reservation. If you need to change it or cancel it, you don't need to worry. Also, like many of you, I'm pretty busy. And when I make my reservations, whether it's an airline, a concert, a hotel, I often do it at night or on the weekend. 
Well, guess what? Almost every scheduling center is closed after 5 o'clock and on the weekends. Well, with online scheduling, open table, think open radiology, you can schedule any time and every time that you want. So there is no issue with that. So the convenience is amazing. Also, if you think about it, I was involved with radinfo.org, which is sites from RSNA and ACR, which has tremendous amounts of information for the patient. It's a wonderful site. It's over a million hits. I think it's run by Jeff Rubin now. And the site is designed only for patients. It explains every single study, the prep for the study, how the study is done, what happens after the study. You're allowed to reuse that information. So now on your website, if someone gets a CT scan, you then say, do you want to know about the CT scan? And you can have all that information mailed to them by email, of course. And they could read everything so the patient can be more knowledgeable. They can understand what IV contrast is. Then you have a button. If you have any questions, press here. And someone who knows something will answer you. We had Brian King from Marriott here. He was showing how they make reservations. He made the point that if you don't make a reservation in 20 seconds because you're on hold, or you don't make a reservation in 30 seconds, you lose 20% of your business. And every 30 seconds loses 20% of the business. So he makes certain that you're answered quickly and the person who will take your questions is well trained to be able to answer your questions. Because all of us know, you, me, everyone in this room, everyone in the universe knows that the worst thing is to do is to ask someone a question and get a stupid answer or the I don't know or let me get back to you or let me get my supervisor. No one has the time to be messing around. So we can't really afford to do that. The second thing is, um, what about protocols? Well, the computer can help with the protocols. It could surely know what the protocol was last time and match that protocol for that patient. It could surely help you make the protocol better to reduce the dose and maximize the information. And once we get the scan, the computer can help you read it. On our Felix project, which is the early detection of pancreatic cancer, our results now are shocking. We can pick up cancer in better than 90% of the studies. We're doing more and more work, but it's unbelievable how good the computer is at detecting lesions, both small and large lesions, particularly the small ones. And we're getting better and better. And you see articles published about pneumonia, that computers can do better than chest radiologists. You see articles about bone age, that the computer could do the bone age rather than a radiologist. You see articles about looking at plain films, extremities, uh, particularly in the hand and wrist, the computer can do better than the radiologist. You're seeing this on and on. You're seeing that the computer is better for looking at stroke. The computer is better than for looking at plaque. The computer is better for calculating volumes. The computer is better for calculating measurements, rhesus reads. You think about it, it's going to change everything we do. Now, the key thing, <coughs> excuse me. The key thing is to be on top of that. Now you could say, well, this is not gonna happen. I'm telling you it's gonna happen. You can argue with me two years, three years, five years, it's gonna happen. The FDA, now uh, with Gottlieb, is very good about trying to approve the new apps for deep learning, and they actually have a publication which tells you how to get things approved. The FDA is committed to having deep learning work and they're committed to make certain that it's not dragged on with bureaucracy to make it never happen. All of this is critical for us because better diagnosis will improve patient care. We talk about a 30% error rate. Institute of Medicine talks about one in five people will have a bad outcome because of a medical error. We're never going to avoid medical errors 100%. We're never going to eliminate misreads 100%. But if the articles say there's a 30% misread when the positive findings are present, we have a long way to go. Even going from 30% to 10%, that would be unbelievable. It's kind of like driverless cars. There's 150,000 people every year killed in the U.S. in accidents. Forget how many people are injured significantly. With 150, 150,000 are killed, with driverless cars, as long as there are still cars that are driven and driverless cars together on the road, they predict it'll be 25,000. Now you could say is, oh my God, 25,000 people were killed because of driverless cars. Or you could say 125 people lives were saved. 
because 150,000 minus 25 is 125,000. So it depends what you're looking at. And if you say to me, the computer will always be right reading the film, and if it's wrong one time, you're gonna say the computer's an idiot, I'm gonna say that's not the case. Now the goal will be the computer should be helping us out. But we know very well in many things, whether it's EKGs or pap smears, different lab tests, the computers can do better. And in many cases, replace the rate the pathologist, except in select cases. So how good we are, I think mammography, mammography is going to be replaced because mammo is so much easier on a computer. It's very good at picking up small findings as well as interval changes. Mammography will change. If you're a breast imager, you can do other things, biopsies. But I'm telling you, that stuff is your toast. Now, remember, they have pigeons doing it. So I'm worried about what's going to happen to all those pigeons that are reading the mammograms. Are they going to have to go to park benches or something? Or are they going to have to go to Venice and sit in the mall there? I'm not positive of that, but I am positive that that is going to happen. That's going to happen sooner than you think. The key for radiology then is to get involved. Whether you're the technologist, okay, Siemens this year at RSNA had a camera that sits above the patient that centered the patient perfectly. Typically, technologists, even good ones, center the patient incorrectly 30% of the time. The centering defines the radiation dose. You decrease the dose significantly when the patient's properly centered in addition to getting good quality images. Okay. Well, you know, if a computer can do it, well, you need so such sophisticated technologists. It's interesting, right? Our techs are great at Hopkins. What if the computer could decide the optimal protocol, center the patient, and do everything, and you just simply go up to the scanner? Well, that is interesting. Uh, will affect, will, will the technologists become better trained or less well trained? What's going to be the role of the technologists in the future? Great question. In terms of physicians, uh, you, Scott, wants to know what does the human do better? I think the human do, does better, hopefully, um, in, in uh, speaking to the patient and referring docs, though, of course, with Lexus, perhaps, or uh, with rather, not Lexus, Alexa, um, we call it Lexus for short, but Alexa, you know, the you may talk to Alexa, and, and you may ask Alexa, what did my patient's report show? And it may say a pancreatic mass in a 22-year-old. And Alexa, what most likely is it? Well, based on statistics, it's a spend tumor. So I don't know. I think what we need to do is to figure out where our added value is in the process, and our added value is going to change as computers get better. I think we need to be the ones embracing that change and adjusting our practices accordingly. Obviously, if you're an interventional radiologist, it's probably not going to matter, though I have seen some AI-guided things which will do biopsies perfectly, or put catheters in perfectly. So there are a lot of things which AI can guide, but probably in that case it's making you do better. Um, I think in terms of physicians, uh, bedside manner, speaking with the patient, I think uh, that may take some work on our part. People have a, radiologists have a tendency not to want to speak to patients in many cases. But I think how we work with referring docs, I think we talk about value over volume, perhaps more consultation, using our information and our knowledge based on everything we acquire, whether it's simply the, uh, the computer acquisition or the various information that comes back to us, whether it's the radiomics that so we could say is a pancreatic mass, as a carcinoma, and based on radiomics, it will respond to fulfurinox or will not respond to fulfurinox. We can use our information for helping guide when patients are operated on, whether imaging studies are necessary, what information needs to be generated. I think it's something that's going to be a work in progress for a while. Um, John says the computers never buy him dinner. All right, I'm working late tonight, I'll buy you dinner. But I'm telling you, you give the computers some money, not only will they buy dinner, They'll cook it, they'll deliver it, they'll call the uh, delivery, they'll go to the computer has friends. So our program probably has friends over at Open Table or Grubhub, and if that computer gets to Grubhub, Grubhub then sends the food. So, and then it gets paid for by your Amex. So all of those things can work out. But I think the one thing is we need to be paying attention to what's happening. And if you look at things in other fields, I mentioned I went to uh, the Computer Electronics Show, CES this year, 
And to me, it was mind-blowing because it wasn't they were showing me how to do my practice, but they were showing me what people do in other fields. And then you quickly could realize what the opportunities are for you. So there's a lot going on. And at CTSS, I think we want to make certain that we're on top of it, that all of you are kind of on top of the process. So you'll be seeing, we're developing new sections. We're going to be developing lectures on this as well. Um, so it's really going to be a big work in progress, and we're very excited about that. If anyone has any questions or uh, comments or things they would like to see us do, uh, let us know. Um, and um, with that, I think my 15 minutes of fame is up. And if you have any more questions, just get back to us. And uh, we do appreciate as we develop this uh, new part of our website, for you to let us know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what else we should be doing. Uh, we think we have good ideas, but we always need to have feedback of what we're doing to adjust mid-course or develop new things or just simply change. So with that, I'll say bye. Thank you for your attention and see you next week. Bye-bye.